Yeah, that's good. Testing. Is that better? Oh, good. Hey, welcome online, folks. This is our garden class on fruit trees. We are glad you are here. Hey, uh, Jeremy, where's our parameters? Where can he walk? Am I out of this? Oh, oh, good. Sip this. So yeah. I'll uh, catch the glare. So we, we are, uh, I'm tag teaming this one today. So my name is Ken Lane. I own the garden center. I'm second generation garden center owner. So my father-in-law, Harold Waters, started the business back in 1960. Comes in pretty often. Um, and so my wife works here, Jeremy, my son in law. Of course, my oldest daughter works here. I've got identical twin girls. If you see one gal up here that's real tall and pretty, and then another gal that looks exactly like her is checking you out. They're sisters, not checking you out, but checking your stuff out. Ringing getting you, you through up, the registers. Ringing you up. Yeah, ringing you up. Um, that's kind of the family business. Also, I think a couple dogs are here today. So, yeah. How many? I don't know how many family members that makes, but that's us. Kevin Michaels is one of our, he is probably our premier tree and shrub guy. So, Thank if you. you want to know trees and shrubs, he's our go to guy. He's, he knows what's in stock, he knows how it grows. His radar is always out trees and shrubs. And so he's just here representing that. So I thought, hey, Kevin, would you, would you teach this class with me? Because I've been on vacation for a week on Lake Powell. That's a great place, houseboating up, up Lake. Um, I actually don't know what fruit trees are in. I didn't. I should have walked through over there, but I figured I got you. We have a lot. I got my Kevin. We have a lot. So anyway, that's kind of who we are, what we are, what, what we're doing. So um, fruit trees grow really, really well. Let's just get out of the way what doesn't grow. You cannot grow citrus up here. Right. Just check it off the list and go, not going to grow that. Well, we're not going to sell it. You can get, if well, you have a great big bright glass room, you can do some kumquats or maybe a satsuma tangerine in a pot. Inside. Inside. Yeah. But you want to keep it outside and then just wheel it in into a bright yeah. window. Right. But so, that's about as successful as you're going to get. Don't yeah. go big. Don't go Myers. But... And we, and we just won't bring them in because of the lack of success. Yeah. And then avocados. You're not going to grow avocados. You poor Southern California folks. You miss your avocados, but you can grow artichokes. So that's a good thing. So those, that seems like to be tag teamed. So, but you can grow apples and pears and cherries and apricots, nectarines. There's so many plums. You, so many things you can grow right outside and be hugely successful. The main thing you really want to watch, and we're bringing in varieties that are blooming later in the season. We focus in on chilling hours. So if you read a tag of a, of a, of a fruit tree, it'll say it needs 700 chilling hours or 1,000 chilling hours. That is, how many hours of cold and winter does it need before it's programmed to go bloom? The desert varieties might need 150, 200, 300 hours. So they're blooming in January, February, March way too early in our frost last frost date it's like in may there's no way a desert variety will fruit up here so if you've been frustrated over the years and you bought your fruit tree from home dumpo or someplace they're going to sell the desert varieties so they're going to go send 50 of those trees to all my stores in arizona and let the buyer beware and you go buy them go i've got this great desert desert rose apple oh it's coming to be so happy it'll be a beautiful tree It'll blossom in like February and never fruit. And you'll be very frustrated. And might not make it through the winter. It, yeah, it may not even make it through the winter. But anyway, it's not going to fruit for sure. And you'll blame yourself. It wasn't you. You were sold the wrong thing. The other thing to watch is age. Fruit trees need to be about seven years old before they're old enough to fruit. And so all of our fruit trees here, we focus in on older trees. We figure customers that shop at Waters Garden Center are impatient. And they want fruit like now, not, not five years from now, now. And so they'll sell whips, what they call them, whips. So you're only one or two years old. You do the graft. You put your Macintosh apple on there. And you grow it up to this tall. You know, it's, it's cheap. It's $39.99. Hey, they'll buy them. But you're not going to get fruit for another five years. So all of our trees are, are at least five to seven years old. So they're of fruiting age. 
Now, we don't allow them to fruit in the racks. In fact, we've just gone through and shaped all of the fruit trees so they get the right form. I personally kind of, so they call it the scaffolding. So it grows so it'll hold more fruit, be more straight. And then we picked every single fruit off because that tree is either fruiting or it's rooting. Well, first year, year one, I don't want it to fruit for you. I want it to root. So it's, I don't want to put all the energy into fruit. I want to enter those roots. And so we have physically have picked, it's kind of painful to go pick off all the fruits because sometimes that inspires folks to buy that peach tree. But it's better for, it's more success. We're trying to increase success. And so those are things to watch. Age, make sure you get an old enough one. And then variety, make sure you got chill, minimum chilling hours, minimum 600 hours. I would say to 700, somewhere in there. So, and then even then you get this cycle. So always apricots bloom. They're the first fruit tree to bloom, always. Then it's nectarines right after them. Then it's probably plums and peaches and then pears and apples. There's a sequence. In spring, you'll just see that the first blooms are the apricots. So out of all the apricots, we're picking the varieties that are the latest bloomers of all the apricots, but they still bloom first, but they're not blooming in January. They're blooming in into March, April. So you might have to watch them. So apricots are one of those things, you're either feast or famine. You better have the canned goods ready to go because you're gonna be buried in bushels of apricots or none. So the frost got them. So you kind of get these two things. Peaches are really successful. The most successful of all the fruit trees, if you're starting with just one fruit tree, I'm not sure where to start. Start with apples and pears because they're the last fruit to bloom in spring, typically end of April through May. They're, they're starting, they're waking up and blooming. So you're out of that frost cycle. So many times up here in the mountains of Arizona, trees are tricked into uh, blooming early. So it gets real warm. And they go, oh, it must be spring. They bloom. And then all of a sudden we get that last freak snowstorm. It's so common. And then it burns off the fruit. It burns off the, the flowers. Uh, we like it because we sell lots and lots of frost covers and all this kind of protection stuff. That's kind of the apples and pears you usually don't have to do that with. They just bloom late enough where you're out of that far out of that uh, sequence. But I've been the judge at the county fair where I had no fruit to judge. That's painful, except for grapes and some berries. There were no apples that year, no peaches that year. On both, this is the Yavapai County Fair. Even the Verde didn't have any, it just got it. So some years are like that, it's pretty rare. Sometimes we always get some sort of fruit cycling through. So fruit trees do well here. So that's all I had, I'm done, it's all yours. I don't believe it. <laughs> Not for a minute. Well, you hold him to that. Um, so just a little bit. I'll, try, I'll spend as little time on me as possible. But I've been growing fruit, edibles my whole life. I put a tie on for several years and continued to do that. And when I moved from Texas to Arizona, I still had a tie on. I didn't understand the soil was was kind of a problem for me. And so I did get. Um, my master gardener certification from ASU to make sure that I understood the dirt so I could knew that I wanted to do this part time kind of had my eye on Ken and his family's business as I would come up here and visit. I'd always walk the place, pick their brains, just kind of look at it. Someday I'll be able to have a yard like this. I had probably 25 spe spe species of barrels and, and aloes and all kinds of stuff in my desert yard. And I no thorny, nothing thorny. I might make an exception for maybe a gooseberry or something up here, but I'm done with the cactus. I'm a resident here, um, seasonal part-time to help Ken sell the stuff. And, and in doing that, I can't be successful unless you're successful. So I'm here to help you do it right. And we want you to do it now because uh, the, this monsoon gives us a really neat window for planting. Oh yeah. And um, so um, that's where I'm coming from. And a couple of things that Ken touched on Apples are great. Pears are great. Make sure you plant a species that you like. That's real important because that bumper crop will come. Yeah. You will. You. you <laughs> oh, I know what I'm giving everybody for Christmas this year. So you're going to get your cans, you get your jars up early and stuff like that and get all ready. But don't get, well, I don't know. They say you can buy, uh, you can grow Granny Smiths real well up here, but I don't really care for them. Don't buy a Granny Smith because that, that year will come. You'll have a lot of them. 
Bake, uh, bake more pies. Bake Bring more them pies. to Waters Garden pies. Center. So you yeah. heard us online, right? We don't bake sell more flour, pies. So he'll find a way of, of selling wheat so that we can have a class on how to make flour. <laughs> yeah. um, and then check your cross pollination. A lot of the stuff that we bring in is self fruiting. It'll say on the tag, but these guys need to talk to each other. They need to, the bees need to do their magic. And we have a lot of self pollinating and that's real easy to have multiple fruit trees. Um, but <clears throat> pardon me, if they don't work right, then and if your neighbor doesn't have the right tree or it doesn't exist somewhere in the neighborhood, um, you're going to be sorry. You're going to have really cool fruit flowers and stuff like that, but hardly any fruit, if any at all. So check your pollination, check your chill hours. The definition of a chill hour is um, 45 degrees or lower. So that's the number of hours that it's at 45 or less um, collectively. Trees are smart, aren't they? Trees are smart. Yeah. Uh, we had a rule, two rules in Texas. One was when the mesquite budded out, that was when you could plant. You could trim your roses and you could plant because that was the last thing to come out. It wasn't going to freeze again after the mesquite budded. And the uh, sage would bloom three days before it rained. So those were our barometers. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's weird. And you would know that the atmospheric pressure was changing. Our little monsoons were coming a couple of days ahead of time. Here so, is dew point. So I'm passing this around because you mentioned <laughs> pollination. So I wrote a book. Maybe 50 oh, pages is not extensive, but it's got all the pollination charts. It's got the planting guide. All the stuff we're talking about will be in the book. It'll be in a PDF format. So you can download on your iPad, your desktop, wherever you want. You can print it out if you want. Save it in your garden journal. In, virtually any device can open it up. And so that'll be in your inbox here shortly. If, they, if you want that, just put your email yeah. address down. Then also I've got the planting guide. How do you plant it? Which we'll cover. And then... It's not related to this topic, but it's this is the time to fertilize. Take advantage of the monsoon. This is a whole nother growing season. This, we have basically three planting seasons here. Spring, which we've just come out of. June is the hardest month to grow anything because it's hot, it's dry, and it's windy. Those are not good. That's not good for brand new foliage, tender growth foliage. They like, they, they like, I mean, hit wind with these, some trees they get wind whipped or torn or uh, shredded sometimes. Well, now you can fertilize and you get a whole nother set of growth. It's a great time to plant trees. As long as you're not putting it into dry, crusty soil, if you hydrate that soil around it, tremendous time because plants are actively growing right now, including new things you just put in the ground. Also including well, tumbleweeds, and yeah. whorehound. And yeah, all that stuff that you, you didn't put in the ground. <laughs> it's really only a weed if you don't want it. Yeah. Some of the natural stuff is really pretty. <laughs> <clears throat> but playing on that, we're going to miss some things. And that little booklet is, is going to cover it all. Plus, if, you, if you're better audio as opposed to reading it, all of these that we have, whether it's vegetables or ornamental trees, they're all recorded and YouTubed on the, online. Right. And to touch on that, because <clears throat> we really don't have an outline and we're not following the schedule. Just Yeah, we do. We're here. tag teaming. Ta yeah, there we go. Uh, Please come in and check out the inventory. Like today, you're getting pick of the litter on some of these dwarfs that I'll point out in a minute because we just got them in. But the, um, we have a, uh, an accountant that has decided that she is going to make sure everything's in inventory. And it's not tied to the register, uh, so it doesn't take one away when we sell something. But if, the, if you look on order online on our website, uh, there'll be, there won't be wisteria one day. The next day, there'll be 15 wisteria order it online, one of us will pick it out. And if there's more, you can trade it out, but then you get one. Yeah. If you, uh, if you wanna just drive down and grab one real quick. Right now, because of our change of the market and all the development going on, we have a whole lot more landscapers in here. And it's, uh, if you procrastinate, you won't get pick of the litter, yeah. you'll get pick of what's left over. You may not get anything at all. It's yeah, well, <laughs> I, te I tease people, uh, somebody's gonna develop someplace, I got all these aspirin against the wall, Somebody's going to come up with Aspen Creek neighborhood and they're going to say, yeah, I need them all. And you're going to come to me and say, Kevin, you had 25 of them yesterday. And I'm like, yeah, that was yesterday. Yeah. So uh, the caveat here is I am a salesman. It's my job <laughs> to sell the product, but I have to manage the expectations as well. So I don't want it, it happens more often than not. And people will just laugh and look at me and go, yeah, I'm that guy. I want all of those. And uh, we load them. They up never buy them in just ones. No. Well, first of all, fruit trees, you need to buy in pairs. Just They do better in buddies. They, 
peaches will, will sell fruit. But if you get two different varieties, they fruit better. They get larger fruits, more fruits. You'll get better pollination. Apples do better when you have two. Yes, there are certain varieties that will fruit by themselves, so the fruits will be smaller and less of them. If you had a different variety, and it can't be the same variety, they need to be a different one. They, they difference pollinate each other. That's where that chart at the end of the racks, we've got pollination charts to help you figure that out because it's complicated. So don't make a mistake on that one. Really do your homework or check with professionals because we just know because we do this for a living. So and then if for you folks online, if you go to you, you're allowed to open up another open up another window. Go ahead. I know you're doing it anyway. Stop looking at Facebook. Anyway, you're over here. Uh, you can open up and go to uh, top 10 trees top 10 fruit trees or top 10 plants. We bought all the top 10 things. I don't know why they were available, but I bought them all. So anything that's planted plant wise, top 10 trees, flowers, annuals, perennials, I bought them all and they're gaining in value right now. So well, it's, it's kind of good. Yeah, we got, we had some different thing. elements pushing out the uh, edibles in the greenhouses, but uh, I want to take a second to promote what we have here a little bit because it's a comfort level. There is stuff that comes to the gate that we send back. Yeah. Um, March was 59 years in business. Um, Mr. Waters, as well as the Lane family, we it's here because it grows here. So it's not, well, does this do well? Uh, it might be an annual as opposed to a perennial, but if it's on our lot, it should be able to grow here. That doesn't mean you can't kill it, and that's our job is to try and keep you from killing it. And the expertise really is here. There's um, most of the people that, that haven't lived and grown up in the industry and don't just live and breathe this stuff and actually practice it at home. They'll either master gardeners uh, by education or master uh, certified nurserymen or both. So anybody here, we try really hard, even the guys that are just supposed to be watering and carting stuff around or learning all the time to be able to help you. And, and they're programmed to say, I don't know. So the, instead of making something up, which is kind of comical in sales, but don't uh, bluff, if, if don't, bluff. don't bluff, no bluffing allowed, no bluffing allowed. <laughs> and to touch on this pollination thing, because this is kind of fun. I saw this developing. Well, I used to have um, a 19 acres worth of fruit and veggies and roses in the middle of Phoenix. And we bought and, and uh, went and visited all the growers around the country and stuff like that. And a movement that was happening 20 years ago was, um, Instead of having five, we still buy them, uh, fruit salad trees where you have three or four apples grafted onto one tree. That'll help with your pollination, obviously. So if you have a single apple anywhere, as an aside, check with your neighbors and see what they're growing. Yeah. And you would help them and help yourself. But don't buy something that you don't want to eat. The, other, what, what the movement now is to put three trees in a hole instead of grafting them on the same rootstock. So you just dig a bigger hole and put three trees in the same hole. And they work really well if they're stone fruit, which are cherries and apples. It's like you don't have to have all apples in that hole. But that makes it a lot more hardy. If you buy one of the ones that has three or four fruits on the same stock, then you want to orient it so that, and I'll go over this in a second, you want to orient it so that that weaker one, because one of them will be smaller, um, is facing the sun is getting more sun than not. And you all, it's a little trick, but pretty uh, argument saver, if you will. You want to tie little strings on them when you get them, you, or write, actually write on the arm what it is. Because a, um, a loving member of your family will trim them for you while you're in town or on a trip because they look a little scraggly, and they'll take a whole fruit off without knowing it, and it's happened. Yeah, so more than I once. have cried uh, in the past. <laughs> Come home. Oh, honey, I hired some landscapers to do your trees. No. And only four varieties. Yeah. Only, of, uh, no. five. Just be careful about that. <laughs> but if it's on our lot, we take great pride in that. And we send a lot of stuff back. The growers know it. Uh, they, so we don't get, we don't get the leftovers. Um, we're bringing in when it's pretty. They want it to be blooming. Uh, but you know, so they push them and I'll go over that term in a second also to avoid any burning when you plant stuff But if it's here, they've taken great. They've visited these growers. They know what these people expect uh, They know that it's kind of get sent back We're not going to pay for it if it doesn't meet our standards or the standards that we want to incorporate into 
Prescott, we want growing in your backyard. So have some confidence with that. Why don't I explain semi-dwarf, dwarf, perfect, full dwarf, standard, what's the difference, that kind of does sound okay. And then you can just kind of maybe feature some of the trees or I know you've got some things set yeah, up. Which we'll go into some planting and stuff like that. So yeah. let me preset the stage so that we can take this and create a separate YouTube educational video just on this. So I'm gonna like start over again and go just so we can break edit this piece out so it sounds like we're starting we're just gonna we're doing it to make ken's job easier so okay you ready so um ken here at waters garden center and there are basically four different types of fruit trees you'll find sizes here at waters garden center sizes so their, your grandparents always grew a standard size fruit tree they're going to be about 25 feet tall 20, 25, somewhere in there. Fruit trees in general are small compared to a 70 foot sycamore or cottonwood or willow. So they're pint size, but still they can get out of reach where you can even on a ladder and a fruit picker, you can't quite get there. That's a standard size fruit tree. So if it doesn't have a name, it just says Fuji apple, that's a standard size fruit tree. From there we step down to, that's kind of a head high. If you think head high, kind of chest high, hip high and knee high, this is kind of how, how we grab, we, how, we, how we do this. And so standard is going to be standard head height. Semi-dwarfed, it'll be 25% shorter. So if it says semi-dwarf Fuji apple, that's all of a sudden it's going to be a click shorter. It still looks like a big tree, but instead of 20, 25 feet, now it's in the teens. So you're definitely down a click, but it's still big enough to look like something out in the landscape. Then you get dwarfed. Dwarfed is pretty much half size. So instead of 25 feet, it'll be 10, 12 feet. So it's kind of hip hype size. So it just kind of steps down size-wise, not my hip, the tree's hips. So anyway, just half the size. That would be dwarfed variety. You're really specialized at this point. So you're really getting, and I'll tell you how we do this in a second. Then you get into genetic dwarf. These are really small. They only get up, they're mainly uh, grown in containers, they're featured in flower beds. They're, they're ornamental. They're pretty. The size of the tree changes from standard to semi-dwarf to dwarf to genetic dwarf. But the fruit does not change. The size of the fruit is the same. So an Alberta per peach, a standard size, semi-dwarf, semi standard, the, the peach is the same. The quantity may vary. So a full size has more capacity, more scaffolding, more branching to create more fruits, but sometimes you just don't want a 20 foot uh, fruit tree out there. You want a 15 foot. And so that's the difference. So full size, standard, semi-dwarf, dwarf, and genetic dwarfed. And how we do this, it's all about the right root stock. So we're taking certain roots. So we're physically taking a root stock that handles clay soil because that's mainly what we're dealing with, and alkalinity. So we know which varieties of, plant, of root stock will do that. We're taking that root stock, and then we're grafting the, the variety that say Macintosh apple, or a Bing cherry, or a whatever it is. We're grafting onto that root stock, and then we'll grow it out for two, three, four, five years. So that's, we're very strategic with this. In addition to that, we're now taking root stocks that are uh, for, for clay, we're going for some roots actually limit the growth size. So we're, we're, it's dwarfed by taking a different type of root stock and it controls the top growth. So this, we're in the deep science here, but this is botany. We are, all of our trees are grafted, every single one. We don't start anything by seed. You don't want to either because you get these wild, freaky, it's not the same thing as what you want. You want a red haven peach. If you just do it by seed, one in 20 will be like its mother. The others are misfits. So by grafting, we get exact varieties every single time, exact replicas, clones per se, of that mother plant. We're taking off that perfect tree, grafting onto a certain rootstock. And that's how we're, we're controlling or, or offering the perfect fruit tree. That's, that's, that's kind of, does that make sense? Like, we went a little bit deeper than we wanted to, but now I'll pass and go, oh, where are we at? And then I'll turn my microphone off because it's like I'm the one causing are you that. This, okay. uh, am I? We'll see. Okay. Nope, it's not me. Oh, it's you. And oh, so it's me. Nope, it's you. Hold on. 
So pruning to size. If you need to, we could do this too. We could do that. Do that. Um, try it. Just try this. I think. We, well, let's see if anybody can hear because I well, talk with my hands. You have to. Uh, they can't hear you without this. Oh, this is tight in. Just for you. Just for you. No dancing. Just um, flapping. So inside of this little clip that you're going to get is um, when you put your email down is our uh, list of... Uh, I'm not holding this for you. I'm sure you are. But it needs to be closer to your to your mouth or they can't hear you. They uh, literally can't hear you. What to do when. I think this is really important. And whether we're selling Aspen or we're selling um, apples, uh, the big question is, well, or the statement often is, I don't want a 40 foot tree. I don't want a 25 foot tree because that's what the label says. I don't want to accuse the uh, growers of exaggeration. Let's just call it optimism. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah. right? So right. they are in a perfect environment. They're probably putting down a real, a real number if it were to stay on their farm and uh, they took care of it for their life. Or anywhere in the Midwest. Anywhere in the Midwest. And, but, and I mean, but unless you're going to leave for 10, 15 years, that tree, if it's specced at 25 feet, isn't going to be 25 feet. Right. And you're pruning fruit trees specifically for fruit production. You're taking branches out to make it healthier, but also so that it will put on new branches so that those new branches are going to put on your flowers and your fruit. And if you were to go in thinking that, then I, uh, having said that, I enjoy the, um, the landscape element of the real dwarfs because I can get fruit real low and I always want something to eat out of my yard and it can be in my bed of perennials. Yeah, you Thank go. you. Um, but I'm buying standard trees unless I'm putting them in containers and I'm trimming them down so that my fruit is this high, maybe a flat um, step stool, not a ladder. I, I'm, I don't like to be on ladders and trees. I'm either in the tree or in the, on the ladder. Uh, not both, it's a little dangerous, but... Uh, <laughs> Apples are great horizontal growers, and um, they're talking about fruit size, and there's also a fruit drop that I want you to be aware of in the cycle that you'll see on how to do what. Your tree is going to set fruit. Let's have a perfect environment where, or a perfect season. You get your blooms and you get your fruit. The, the tree itself is going to decide based on uh, how the soil was the year before, how it's fed, how much water it's been receiving. It's going to decide how big that fruit's going to be, and it's going to decide how many of that fruit it's going to keep on the tree. And a lot of your reading, you will see that you're encouraged to take off a certain amount of the fruit. It, some, some growers refer to a percentage. Uh, some of them look at clusters. You know, you, want to, you don't want to take off any more than 20% of your leaves, or, you know, there's magic formulas out there to try and make it easy for you. I've never counted the amount of leaves before I've trimmed a tree. So I don't know how that works, really. It's surface area. But I let the tree, and this is a sequence of events, I will let the tree drop the fruit that it doesn't want because it's probably going to anyway. I, and then I will thin out the fruit that I need to thin out. Does you follow me? Because the tree's going to do it. And it may have already earmarked the one next to the guy I'm gonna pull off, right? So I'll take a bunch off and then it drops. And you'll be in here and asking me why the fruit is dropping. And that's why the fruit is, the tree's already decided. Uh, I can say that, that we get a ton of phone calls starting the end of May, first part of June, just this, this wave of calls going, oh no, my peaches, my nectarine, my, it's a lot yeah. of stone fruits. They're dropping fruit, should I be worried? Go, no, it's called the June drop happens every June. As soon as it gets up to 80, high 80s, 90s, the tree decides, I can't carry all this. I can't take all the moisture and feed all this. I'm going to drop half my fruits. You need that. Otherwise, you won't have any real fruit. You'll have a whole bunch of pits with some skin around it and, and no size fruit. So the tree can only take up so much moisture and nutrients from the roots to feed the fruits that are on there. And so it's just, it's self-regulating somewhat, right. but it's, then you need to help it. It is then off even more. It's self-pruning self in the fruit re in that regard, but it's also um, a lot of what you do this year for your tree and with your tree is going to determine the size and the quantity of the fruit next year. Yeah. It's a pretty quick take up. You can throw nitrogen 
on the ground and your leaves are going to turn green, you'll get a little extra growth. But that fruit is an, is a is a is pretty significant. It's it, it's it's deeper in there. And if you didn't water it properly, if you didn't feed it in the winter, which is something that we need to do, uh, then you're not going to have the fruit production or the size that you want. It's really hard to fatten up a dried up piece of fruit. Yeah. <laughs> um, having said that, when you get into your tr first trimming, this is when I do one of my first trimmings is, is when I'm dropping fruit. All right. I am looking at the inside of the tree and I'm taking out stuff that is not going to receive enough light next year. I'm thinning out that and anything that crosses is a, just a natural. And some of that you can do. You can see if anything is rubbing real easily when the tree is naked. When there's no leaves on it, you can look at it and just take stuff off. And I'm and when I'm doing that, I'm taking it all the way back to the stock. OK, I'm deciding that whole branch and I might touch a branch three or four times before I do something that dramatic. I'm going along it and going taking off a couple little branches and it takes longer. But that's why we're here. We're doing gardening as a lifestyle. It's not just running through and whacking everything for mass production. Having said that, uh, this branch will be laden with fruit. Right. And I, I, we know that we don't want it to try and carry all of that. It's already done its drop and you're gonna to have to take some more off. Well, it's real easy. I've actually taken, instead of the espalier where you take it flat and you just have it going two directions, I will run um, a, a stake in the ground here, especially on apple, and I'll tie this branch to it three feet away from the tree, not tethered or anything like that, but directly to the stake. And then that clump of fruit that's on the end, I'm taking that off. And what, what is that going to do? It's going to lighten the load. I'm going to have more fruit or less fruit per nutrient in the tree. So my fruit's going to be healthier. But also each one of these little leaf nodes is going to send out another branch. That's going to be established. So you'll have done two things with your first trimming. You'll have taken off fruit to lighten your load and have better fruit for what's left. But you're also setting the tree up to produce more fruit next year. And on your long-term thought process in this, this horizontal branch is going to be, uh, it's going to be within my reach, right? I'm not going to be having to get on a tree. You go into some of the old nurseries or the old uh, orchards where they weren't set up for, we're talking hundred year old trees here. They weren't set up for automation. And these guys, they look like stubs. They look like really well taken care of uh, grapevines. There's these horizontal stumps with all these little branches covered with fruit because that's what they've been doing all those years. They've been looking after that. They've been thinking ahead on that. So those are a couple of things on your pruning that are important. And we talked a little bit about planting and I'd like to go over that with you real quick. Can I, can I touch on just the pruning piece? Just, yes. Cause I grow a lot, I grow fruit trees in containers. I grow them out in the yard. I've got a peach tree that's this big around loaded, loaded with peaches that's above my reach. And I use it to shade the hot tub. I just wanted something nice out there that was pretty and I like fruit and peaches. I mean, piss off the tree. My mouth is watering thinking about it. It just, they are so good. Those last few days on the tree is a game changer for the taste of the fruit. When they're doing agriculture, like in your grocery store, even sprouts, whoever, they're picking it not for you, not for taste. They're picking it for shipment. So they're trying to package it. They're picking it way early, so it's less likely to bruise before it gets there. Those last few days, that's when a lot of that sugar content really makes the flavor come out. Uh, for my, for containers especially, less so in the ground, uh, summer pruning, super important. So I've already taken back my peaches. So they call this sucker, this, this brand new growth coming up. That's the sucker. I don't want this tree to be out of proportion to my container. So I never let it get beyond this certain shape and size. And so and the secret is you're taking about 30% of the foliage mass area off in midwinter when it's naked. I never heard that Texas accent until you said naked. You say Come naked, that I say <laughs> naked. We all get naked together. Oh, anyway, and full, uh, I think. so anyway, that's a, uh, I, I'll prune it back that summer sucker. I don't, I'll let it elongate to create the sugars for the fruits. When I'm kind of done with the fruits, I whack on it. So it gets it back to size. Otherwise it grows out of its space. Out of, it looks abnormal. Out in the yard, a little less important, uh, but it, in a container or something, you want to keep it down to size where it's easier to maintain. Really important. So heavy pruning in the winter 
Summer pruning, June, July, typically. I'll whack that thing back. That's maybe 10% of the foliage mass. It's a haircut. It's not all that inner, you know, branches that cross, dead, th anything dead ever, take it out. Uh, but that's kind of 30, 10, 30, 30 in the winter, 10 in the summer. It's very, very common standard practice. That just takes off. Give, us, give our engineers and nurses, the people that do numbers, yep. give them something to think about. She had a question first. So I do what Kevin said. He'll take it back to this branch, back to the to the next, wherever that next branch is. I'll take it back there. Sometimes if, if it's not quite mature yet, so if you'll take it back to a bud, and I don't know if there's a great example of this. So right here, this is a good example. So if I wanted this plant, it's gotten too tall, and I want it to grow this way. If you cut it back to right here to a bud, they call this a leaf bud, and it's growing in the direction you want, all that energy coming from the roots will now go into that leaf bud and start growing in that direction. So you can actually train how you want, what direction you want that. That's anything, a rose, a tree, a grape. Print it back to that bud. If you print it back to all buds that go to the inside of the tree, you're going to have this crossing pattern all over the place. So I'm kind of strategic. I either go back all the way, because that branch is going the direction I want anyway, or I went back to bud where I want in the direction that I want it to grow. So I'm trying to force the, the, the train the tree to grow. We've already done that. I just went through last week through every tree and I shaped it back to, so it will shape what will grow in the right scaffolding, not light, right shape. So yeah. Generally after it's set fruiting, we'll start doing that, that heavier summer prune. Um, it just depends on the variety. Pitted fruits, that's super easy, summer. Apples and pears, if it's too big, I'll just do it because those are fall crops. So I'll just prune it when it gets too big. It's so just that, that's fine. So there's, there's a lot of room for forgiveness with that. The summer pruning, because you're pruning so little, 10% is not very much of the foliage mass. Mm -hmm. You can kind of whack on it and go for it. Uh, winter pruning, they say not to go more than 30%. If you if you bought a house where, where it's just been let go, uh, the gentleman that was there was a gardener, hardcore, but hasn't been physically able to get out there for the last 10 years. And the, the things have gotten too big. It might take a couple years to get that thing back under control. If you take too much, it won't have enough leaf buds to come out and keep it healthy. So just some things. And that'll be in this book. I kind of, this book you're getting, that's all in there. So well, that's a, and that, a lot of that is not going to kill the tree. Right. It's just going to set you back. And sometimes you have to make that judgment call. When I'm cutting, I'm cutting knowing it's going to force out some branches somewhere. Those branches are going to be next year's blooms. So that's I'm think I'm taking that into consideration when I take something off. And having said that, a lot of the trees get, get that get out of control. They made a call in California where they didn't want to pay people to climb on scaffolding to pick avocados. The insurance companies force the industry to reduce the size of the trees. So they'd have to paint the trees to, so the bark wouldn't uh, sunburn and just whack them. And they would do like every other tree so they would get production out of yeah. every other tree. But they had to reduce them so that they could get the fruit down. But they didn't want to kill a 30 year old tree. But you can reduce the size of the trees. So I'm gonna get a couple of things real quick on, on planting. We've got these dwarfs in. I wanted to share this with you because- This? Uh, no, the one in the pot- Oh, I missed a fruit. Look at that. I, I was, yeah, dog on it. Okay, <clears throat> my bad. Take it home. There's so Somebody many fruits, it's home. hard to get them off. Um, rarely do a, oh, come on. Yeah. Okay. Da, da, da. Can I turn mine on? Can you just turn mine on and see if it Here, pops? I'll get you okay, this is a, I, In our world, uh, and my, my mind works around it. Why does it cost so much? Uh, how much does it get here where the age of the tree is significant? Have you ever taken care of a plant or a child for five years? It gets expensive. So if you're selling a five-year-old tree, you realize what, what it costs to get it here. We get buys every once in a while from some of our better growers. And these little guys are such a buy. These are $77 or $72. And they're ready to produce fruit. And I've got a slew of them in different species. And they are the semi-dwarf. So, and I, you know, in our world, there's a the, the price structure is based on the species, so the name of the peach or the the peach itself. 
a peach gets a particular amount. And then the age, which is the bucket size. And because, um, because the waters are fair, we put the same margin on everything. So when I get a good buy, that is passed on to you. A gr another grower um, might charge us more. Well, that I can't absorb that. It's passed on to you. That's why you'll see. So the third element in it is the grower, what they're charging us for. If they don't have to ship it all the way across the planet to get here, you might get as good <laughs> as or a better product for a lot less. These $72 dwarfs are a great buy. And you got 15% off. I can't believe you did that. But I just wanted you. You folks, I'll keep a coupon in for you all too, 50% off. If that. you come in at the register and ask for it, otherwise it's not good after Sunday. So don't so, come complaining to me. When I'm planting, I want to get this in real quick. Um, That's a five-year-old tree, by the way. Yeah, this is probably about five years. Ready to produce fruit. This is, a, this is your uh, graft, as we were talking about. So this is a hardy uh, rootstock with the desired fruit on it. And um, all trees... The fruit trees, all fruit trees are grafted. And That's the uh, graft here. So this little guy is, I would take anything off that comes up from the roots and from uh, the graft itself. Those are suckers. They're going to take energy away from your tree. And it may not be the fruit that this is. If it's not on this stock, it won't be. Yeah. Um, and then uh, you do not make, go out of your way to not plant the tree any deeper than it's grown. The uh, right underneath the skin where you scratch it to see if it's alive and you see the green, that's called meristematic material. And it changes from stock to root. And the roots can handle air and light uh, better than the stock can handle um, the uh, enzymes and things that are in the soil. Pathogens, if you will, that make up, they're not really bad. I, the word pathogens is a bit strong because that's what makes you live, makes your soil living soil, unless of course you're using chemicals for your fertilizers. But um, when don't, you plant it, don't bury the the graft. Whatever you do, it's doomed. If you yeah, do that. you will kill the tree. You when want to you keep see, this exposed to air. When you see a tree that snaps off, um, a big windstorm comes and it just look the tree looked good. Why? And it just snapped right off of the ground. That tree was buried a little bit too deep, yeah. and that dirt got up around there. And that got weak. It yeah. essentially girdled the tree because it was buried too deep. When you see a windstorm come through and, it, and you see the, the stalk with a great big old web of roots standing up on the, on the ground, that's either laying on solid rock or it's shallow water. And there's no reason for the tree to go deep. And that's a dangerous place for your fruit trees as well. But it does happen. People depend on their lawn watering to take care of their trees. So I'm, I'm digging my hole. I'm taking, I did this on purpose. I'm taking my fruit tree out of my bucket Here, to- I'll, um, I'll hold this for you so you, they can hear you online. Thank you. Yeah. To measure my lovely and gracious uh, mic holder here. Uh, to, you use the bucket. It's a lot lighter to measure your hole and get your depth. And remember how far down that was in the bucket. Um, the other thing to do is once you've got your, your size of your hole correctly, thank you. Once you get the size of the hole correct, which is going to be capacity wise, like three times, no deeper than so you don't get any settling and capacity wise, you really don't have to come out real far to get your height. I mean, to get your capacity, right? It's not three. It's, it doesn't have to be this big. Boulders and stuff like that get in your way. You deal with that. The native soil that we have, which is primarily decomposed granite, has a lot of really good mineral content in it. But because it's high pH and your water coming out of your hose or your well, whether it's the well or the city, is high pH as well. The calcium, the salts, everything like that lock up a lot of nutrients that can't be taken up by the tree. So you're going to want to break that apart with acid. Acid is created inside of up mulch, um, inside of these great big yeah. mulch bins where they're making mulch professionally, the size of these buildings. In the sweet spot, they Is create okay? has created humic acid. And if you buy it granular, then you can get the shortcut. This is why people use gypsum and sulfur and other things that will turn to acid. Go straight for the acid. That okay? thing's heavy. So you, really important position that when Ken was talking about training your tree, this is really important. You get your hole the right size. 
you take it out of the bucket, you set it in the hole, get up off of your knees or have your spouse walk around and position the tree properly because you only get one chance. Once you've watered it in, it's, it's a very uh, tedious proposition to pull it out and move the tree, turn the tree. So make sure it's facing the right way where the branches are going, where the structure is going. And then I will use one third mulch to two thirds native soil. And uh, that's important for several reasons, but I will take my- um, Got mulch here somewhere. Yeah, here. I got mulch here. So I am not mixing it in a wheelbarrow off to the side. I'm not doing, again, I'm not calculating 20% or 30%. I'm taking my native soil that I've dug out of the hole, I've excavated it. It's usually in like a damn form because I'm just pulling it out. Sometimes I will use my bucket to fill it full of the native soil just out of convenience because I know I'm taking it out of the hole. I'm putting that much in because this is 100% mulch already. This is mulch grown. So I set him in the hole and then I fill it full of my native soil by a third. And then I put a band of my mulch a third. Then I put a band of my native soil. And then I will fill the hole full of water, like standing water. Make sure I don't have any attachments on my hose. And I'm tapping it down to the bottom of the hole because I didn't make the hole any deeper. I can safely do that without settling. That's doing a couple of things. It'll look like it's boiling. And uh, that is all those, all that native soil, sandy, Ooh. filling into the air pockets. You can't, don't want to leave air pockets. I'm going to hand these out too, out of plant. Well, hand those out. That'll be good. And that's, um, you get untorn. You're insulating the roots. That, that sand untorn is keeping variety. air pockets get, out. That, these are torn a little bit. The just, air pockets will uh, create dry rot in the summer when you're trying to keep that mulch wet. And your roots will get cold in the winter. So you want, that's the purpose of having the native soil in that hole. If you think that you have planted, if you've loved to, loved to plant so much that you put 100% mulch in the hole, you yeah. can remedy that okay. by going out and digging up some of this decomposed granite and pouring it around it and using that as an opportunity to do your deep watering. And if that just disappears into that mulch, you know that there was too much airspace in that hole and you've backfilled with the sand. So it, it is rectifiable. And then I'm letting it settle and I'm coming back with the root and grow, which is a carbohydrate, but essentially a Snickers bars for the, um, for the roots. And someone asked about whether or not I'm fertilizing that, that soon in. Well, our potting soil, our potting soil, I don't, I forgot what is the combo. Is this five, five, five also? No, this is just straight compost. That's the more, that's the nicer stuff. Okay. So there's, because of what it is, it's, this is the potting soil when you go to containers has already got um, enough nutrients in it for a while. This is pretty organic, just raw compost. And you've got it in the hole. I'm putting the rest of this on top and I'm building my dam out of the leftover soil and the mulch so that it, as it decomposes, it feeds the soil and it blocks the evaporation of your moisture a lot. But this is uh, first planting and then uh, every two weeks for three or four applications. But I pour it on anything that you're going to, that you have planted. And this is a great product, by the way, to feed your fruit trees in the winter or any of your perennials. So that's a, um, you, uh, you want the car, when the tree is dormant or your flower is dormant, you want the roots to be doing their thing and they need food and water to be able to do that. And that's a great product for that. That's, uh, that's basically compost tea. This is compost. If you take that, boil it around, come turn into a syrup, root and grow. We're just trying to, to, to stimulate the mycorrhizal colonies, tickles the feet of the roots. It just brings in worms. It just make, makes it's the magic that makes the soil come alive. And so if your plants are stressed, root and grow. If it's the best houseplant food, cactus food, just because it's real light mild so and then so anytime you plant you're gonna need three things mulch which kevin covered you need root and grow that's transplant shock and i would do it two or three times until you see the plant actively growing you go oh stabilized i am a gardener yeah then i would cut it off the root and grow and then i would sprinkle some of this on the very top at the very end this is fruit tree food we made this food for edibles vegetables grapes berries fruit trees this formula is specifically for our climate, our this elevation, and for things that fruit. It's, it's, it's six four four seven, 
we put an extra number in there just because, well, it's got 7% calcium. Calcium is what brings out the flavor and the size. It prevents root rot on, on squash and peppers and tomatoes. We know we're going to struggle with that, so we made the food to help you to help prevent some of that in your gardens. But really, our fruit trees, this brings out the flavor and stuff. So make a bigger, better, better tasting kind of stuff. Yes, in the back. So, so how soon after we plant do we use this? Immediately. I would sprinkle some on the, it's organic. So it's going to break down over the next three months real slowly. So it's not, not a chemical that's going to burn your roots. So it's much kinder than, than, a, than a chemical. We're not believers in chemicals here, so we, we just don't sell we just don't sell chemicals. We go organic. I don't think there's a nursery on that for transplant and seedlings, like herbs and stuff. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
buy two flats and get one free. They're ten ninety nine a piece. Really good deal. And this is oregano. This works. This is evergreen as well. This is going to bloom in the summer. You can walk on both of these and you can eat them. And uh, critters do not like them. They're a little bit too pungent or for whatever the reason. I don't know specifically what goes through a javelina's mind, but they don't eat mine and it's in the front yard. And they're underneath some of my fruit trees to kind of deter them. And that's they even repel bugs. Like it'll keep aphid colonies from collecting underneath the base of your peaches or whatever. So herbs help repel bugs and critters. Yeah. yeah. Uh, herbs. So he's doing creeping thyme and pretty much all herbs, but really oregano. Um, basil will do somewhat. I think oregano does a little bit better. But yeah, all herbs have this fragrant, pungent, oily sense to it, which repels bugs and, and critters generally. Unless they're super desperate. Well, and the, uh, uh, I specifically picked these two because I have luck with them. They're in my yeah, yard. I can speak to them. They're evergreen. So I had two feet of snow, two and a half feet of snow laying on my time. It came out looking a little bit auburn, but it just came, as soon as the sun hit it, it just came roaring back. It's draping. It likes crummy dirt, and uh, it responds really well to a little bit of kindness. I so, can say, if you want to uh, have fun with the grandkids, they come over when the grape harvest is on, and we will eat until we are sick, literally sick. Blackberries. We'll pick blackberries, raspberries, until faces are, these are like five, seven-year-olds. Their face and hands are just black. Their mother's going, what just happened? Okay, we just have a ball. Yeah. Oh, there you go. How cool. fun yeah. is that? Gold, Gold raspberry. raspberries. Very unusual. That's grandkid food, right? That's yeah. Just a, that's just a delight. Very sweet. Same thing. And, and then just be careful about when you're pruning, pay attention to whether or not it's wood stock, which would not be a concert, but whether or not it's going to bloom on fresh or last year's wood, how you cut that. You're not trimming everything like grapes that are going to Don't go over pruning again. Let's go down the plants because you're out of time. Okay. Go this, genetically dwarfed. Thing. Genetically dwarfed peach. Peach. Genetic. What a great container in your courtyard, right? Please don't huh. do a big plastic pot. Do a nice clay pot that's going to uh, serve you well as far as yard art is concerned and insulate the roots well. That one's only going to get, if it's in the ground, it might get four foot by four foot. This is a gooseberry, actually our last gooseberry. That's an old-fashioned plant. Old-fashioned plant, super hardy. There are Draw some hardy. thorns on this, so be careful. And nah. I, and on and read the label because so, sometimes thorn less. The growers, it wasn't intentional, but that just means they have less thorns, and not without yeah. thorns. So <laughs> you have to know how many thorns they had originally. Blueberries. Hold on, right. for you fathers out there, plant a gooseberry just outside your daughter's window. That'll keep the guys away. Pyracantha. 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 Py prickly pear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. We Spanish always bought, dagger. I raised three daughters. We always <laughs> bought them a stick shift kind of car to drive. That was their first car because you can't text as easily while you're doing because it takes all limbs to drive a stick shift. So we didn't get them automatics. And so we got them cute little. And it's just yeah, there's tricks. He's the younger than me. They had phones when my kids, were, <laughs> when his kids were driving. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the grapes are beautiful. You get a lot out of them. This, um, and again, it, Here, they had it expectations. This Just is a, sure. uh, a Kiwi. We're in zone seven. This is a Kiwi for like zones five through eight. And, and uh, it does actually produce fruits. Yeah. And it'll actually produce fruit. What a cool thing. To have and it's a cool, are. just vine, just right. a neat vine. Yeah. Well, and I have to manage expectations. It's the last one I have. It's the last gooseberry I've gotten the last, um, Kiwi I have. Probably not going to get more this season. So we'll get more fruit trees this fall. In fact, we're trying to secure those. The, the market's running out. So uh, take advantage of the figs. I've oh got yeah, a couple got of species of fig. Um, yeah. That's one that uh, will can really be a beautiful tree in a corner. And it'll really fill up, responds really well to uh, dramatic pruning. Puts on a bunch of new fruit. This is a brown turkey. Kind of a Brown standard old fashioned. We, we'll get a Chicago fig again that can handle Chicago winters. I can know. say I've grown this in a, in a pot for many, many years. It's just a pretty plant. They don't get as large as they do in Phoenix. We don't grow fig trees here. You'll never see a tree like you see in Phoenix. You'll see a 50 foot tree. Here, they're shrubs. So the winter, more likely than not, turns them into a perennial. They'll reset underground, hibernate, and they'll come back fresh 
every year they're actively growing. You can almost watch them grow inches a day right now uh, from the ground. So they kind of reset. So you all, always see these great big bushes. And every once in a while with my container, I would roll it up next to the house every winter because the house is amazing. It throws off a lot of heat. It's not, you're not as insulated as you think you are. I just throw it next to the house and it comes back year after year after year without burning back. It keeps the structure going. What I did find is my black Labrador retriever loves the taste of fig wood and figs, which is kind of a race to, to actually get the figs off of him. He loves figs more than I do, I think. Anyway, that's Vincent. You see a black lab roaming around. That's He's basically a food whore. Yeah. Yeah. Pot in the ground, wherever. And Full the sun, thing, bright. Know, know the acclimation of your house, too, because I have um, on the north side up here, the sun moves so much with your hills. It's really hard to get, uh, unless you're in Chino or in Prescott Valley in the flat plains, it's really hard to get the fall, the um, evening burning sun because it's, it's still bright out, but it's behind a hill. Yeah, yeah. Or, but in uh, having said that, my north, the north side of my house, there's a huge portion of it that is shaded for several months because of the house, because of the orientation of yeah. the sun, and that's where my drift is. So I'm not going to put a fig tree in the area where I'm going to get a four foot drift yeah. of snow. Yeah. And um, it, it just, you're fighting. I can say in my container, a beautiful oxblood red pot. I planted, I pruned it up a little bit and I put uh, creeping thyme at the base. It screams, I'm from the Mediterranean. I just planted, just came over from the boat from Greece or something or Italy. It just, it really looks, everyone comments on it. So you can cross, they, they play off each other but they just look good together. So anyway, yeah. Um, I have an elderberry bush. Elderberry, there we go. That's an old fashioned tree. Yeah. But how does it, because I had it in a spot for a year where it was part sun, but a lot of sun, and then it would shade and then come shade. It's been great until this year, when the heat was hitting, it just like, didn't keep it up as far as, uh, it kept it so it was two, three years old, and then this year the drought kind of yeah. got ahead of it. So, so, so for you folks online, elderberry, growing for a few seasons, so it should be fully rooted. And then this year was hard to keep watered. Well, she has it in a pot. Oh, it's no, in a... I had it in the ground. Okay. Out, and then put it in a pot. Yeah. Just, you know, like a couple weeks ago. Yeah. It looks happier and it has new growth. Really? Yeah. Gardeners, you're all the same. You're so good. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay. I don't know why it wasn't doing so well. I thought it was right with the sun. It was doing fine before. Yeah. I don't know, but all I know is I'm talking to a gardener because you read your plant, tried to nurse it. You're still reading your plant going, my little baby's not happy. He dug it up, which is freakish. That's like a gardener thing. And transplant into a container now. Do that, just root it out. I would say root and grow is your secret for that. Just yeah. keep, keep that up on it. See if you can get it fully rooted in that pot, whatever that is. And I would try it again in the yard, maybe not in the same spot. Try in a different other part of the yard. It's full sun. Yep, it's so full sun. Elderberries are full sun. Yeah. So try it. This is called gardening. This is how you learn stuff. You learn it by making mistakes. Yeah, coming to a garden class will hopefully reduces the number of mistakes. At least we're making mistakes going forward. We're trying to help you not go backwards. That's the goal. So, but but you truly learn it by talking to the plants well, and trying here. it. That's like number yeah. one. You'll kill a couple of things. One odd thing will grow really well for you and you'll be hooked. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> then it's, then it becomes a sickness. So we will hang out. So you got your coupon. If you didn't get a coupon, they'll, they just know at the registers, basically just today and tomorrow, we're not going to promote this except for right here. And you folks online, you're the only people that know about it. I don't want this run on our fruit trees. I got enough to get through fall, but for you all, well, it's, we got the it's 50% off dollar dwarfs. And yep. half off the veggies. Yep. Today, half off, the veggies. half off the veggies. I know is running through the weekend. Right, right, right. But so we really, they don't do us any good if they stay here. We'd rather have them in your yard helping you be successful than us having to take care of them. And we'll hang out here and answer questions. We didn't get to your question. We'll just hang. And then Kevin and I will be over in the fruit trees or helping yeah, out. Or, or so, so we're here for you through, through the rest of the day. Thanks for coming. I think next week is, what is next week's class? Do we know? Oh. New oh gardening for newcomers, that'll be a big one. Okay, that'll be that'll be standing room only kind of. Bring your own chair, and I like glazed donuts, so you can bring one of those too. That'd be good. So, anyway, gardening for newcomers next week. 
Uh, there's lots of new folks, and then that's more technical. Frost dates, zones, the growing seasons, mm. food cycles, some plant features, but it's really more the technical side of, of gardening. What's the what's the calendar look like? Uh, so, up, open up your file and flip through it. A couple of reminders. There is lots of great information in there. When you get stumped, go inside and flip through some of the stuff that we the information that we send you. If you want to plant something, um, you know, come and get it, and then log on and look at a couple of the tutorials that we've already done so that you can approach it with confidence. Get someone to help you orient the tree before, get somebody to help you orient the tree before you fill it in. That's a really big step. And order online. Use that online great resource. to check our inventory and to claim one. You know, if it wasn't there on Wednesday, but it shows up on Thursday, order online. Again, you can come in and swap out, but then you get you're getting pick of the litter instead of pick of what's like. We just over. had a customer. We just had some fruit trees coming with this last load, and they they go, "I want a triple play apple tree." There's three trees in the same bucket. We go, "We don't have triple plays apple. We don't have that. It's not in stock." We were sitting across here waiting to be processed to come in line. They saw it, grabbed one. The second you hit pay, it sends out notifications to the entire staff. They all go running to go try to figure out where this is because you're competing with folks in store and online. So Put you're competing for the inventory. So we try to grab it. one before you go, oh, so you'll actually be notified before we are sometimes mm -hmm. on what's here kind of stuff. But it's made to be Wouldn't there. Verify as a what is on the uh, list on the truck, the manifest. And as soon as we are sure about the count, we hand it to accounting, yeah. they drop it into the inventory and you can see it online. But some of this stuff, I'll get five. And some of them will get 15. Um, I think that's what we did with all these different right. fruit trees. We got five of all the, of probably five or six different species of those dwarfs. The main and thing too online is we're putting the description, how it grows here. So, so we're, we're putting the size parameters uh, for here, not Oregon or Ohio. It's for here, which is shorter. Things are going to grow about 20% shorter than they are smaller than they are in their prime it's the dryness and the alkalinity does that to them. So we're putting those parameters. So it's a great resource for education. But let's let's give it up for a moment. It's my first time to teach with Kevin. So you are awesome. I even learned a couple of things. Thank you very much. Yeah. Again, Appreciate it. That was fun. For Super fun. Uh, and then we'll hang out for you. You are dismissed. Thank you. Yeah. In the back. Yeah. Come on through. Sure. Yeah. Uh huh. What kind of bush is it? What, what is it? The blueberry. Blueberry, okay. Right. Almost guaranteed a blueberry there is, is going to be a, a, really a uh, but it will be in the thing. shape of that. It's got so alkaline. Yeah, you're saying it right. Probably you almost need both for blueberries because well, they like do, acid. Uh, when you go the and every time you water it, just makes it alkaline. So you're, you're fighting that. And when you do that, that they've gets, cut the leaves get smaller, the fruits will go. It'll get, that's, that's an alkalinity thing, almost guaranteed. So, so you, you usually I'll plant those maybe in some more potting soil. Be... Just pee. And then pee moss is very acidic. kind of helps. And then... And then add sulfur. Add and then sulfur, learn how to make sulfur. Dolmen. Sulfur make.